Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Sakshi Arora Hans, your OBGY faculty at Maro. Today I have brought for you the recall of OBGY questions which were asked in NEET PG 2023. Now, if you are watching this session, I'm sure you are not here to know just the correct answers because the entire YouTube is flooded with recalls of 2023. You are here because you want a more comprehensive discussion of the topics which came in NEET PG 2023. You are here because you want to know what were those important topics which came in NEET 2023. You want a list of those topics probably and you want to know the exact language of the questions. That is what I presume you are here for and that is why I am not going to make this discussion crisp one. I This discussion is going to be a comprehensive discussion so that, you know, the important points which are related to that particular topic on which a question came can be answered, right? So, before we start our recall and I start telling you what questions were asked in NEET PG 2023, a small discussion about how was OBGY in 2020, NEET 2023. See, if you ask me, Number one, yes, the questions came from expected important topics. There wasn't any question which came on a topic which was uncommon, right? Everything came from those topics which we always tell you in class are important. Number two, if you ask me about PYQs, so this time in OBGY, there weren't uh, many PYQs, but yes, the previous year topics definitely were there. Previous year questions were there, but more importance was laid to previous year topics. Third, but then if I say that your entire OBGY could have been solved if you did just the PYQs, that will be an incorrect statement because you will have to know the logic behind that because you know, the language of the question was such that they had twisted the language. So, if you your concepts were not strong, you wouldn't have been able to come to a definite answer. And that is why in Maru also, in my classes also, I keep on repeating the same thing. That please don't mug up OBGY. OBGY is very, very scoring if you understand the concept. So, as I am going to discuss with you the questions, you will see that why am I saying that concepts are important. See, in this uh, NEET 2023, question was asked in anemia and pregnancy. But then it was not a question which was already discussed. It was a question on anemia in pregnancy in first trimester. Everything related to anemia, including management of anemia in first trimester was taught to you. So, I can easily tell you this if you have attended my lectures then and if you are you were you know very attentive during the class I would very proudly say that you could have answered 100% questions right so that was the kind of OBGY paper which had come you just had to apply your concepts and the answer was there in front of you you could have come to the correct answer very very easily right so uh Coming to the list of topics from where questions came in OBS and Gynae in NEET 2023. This is going to help you for your future exams. So, questions came from cancer cervix and there was not just a single question on cancer cervix. There were two to three questions which came on cancer cervix. Then infertility, hysteroscopy and laparoscopy questions were asked on them. PID, then question was asked on syndromic management, primary amenorrhea, DSDs. Then there was an image of Bartholin abscess and an image of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. In OBS, questions were, came from obstetrical score, supine hypotension syndrome, conditions where height of the uterus is more than POG, ectopic pregnancy management, unruptured ectopic pregnancy management, external cephalic version or transverse lie, anemia in first trimester and partogram. Right, so these were the topics from where questions came in OBS and Gynae in NEET 2023. So, with this, I'm going to start my discussion with the first question and this time I'm going to be discussing Gynae questions first and then we'll go to the OBS questions. Now, a 54-year-old woman was diagnosed with advanced cervical cancer. She has a 14-year-old daughter. What advice would you give her? Now, 
So, over here, if you see in the options, the first option they have given you is screen for BRCA mutation, screen for P10 mutation. Now, I always I have told you that cancer cervix has no relation at all to BRCA gene mutation or to the P10 gene mutation or to link syndrome. It is the ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer which are related to all these right cancer cervix has no relation to them another thing which i always keep on telling you is that cancer cervix is not related to early menarche and late menopause it is not related to early menarche and late menopause very very important point right what is cancer cervix related to cancer cervix is related to early age of intercourse Cancer cervix is related to early age of first pregnancy. It is not related to early menarche and late menopause, right? So, obviously, option A and B are incorrect. I am not going to screen for P10 mutation in a daughter. I am not going to screen for BRCA mutation, right? Now, come, am I going to do a cervical biopsy? Cervical biopsy is a diagnostic test for cancer cervix. So, I am not going to do a biopsy in a 14-year-old girl who doesn't have any symptoms of cancer cervix just because her mother has cancer cervix. I won't do a biopsy in her, right? That is common sense. So, when you exclude, by exclusion, your answer comes, you are going to give her HPV vaccine and that is uh, what you also know, that there are two methods for preventing cancer cervix right one is screening for cancer cervix now screening for cancer cervix at what age it is going to begin according to acog the screening for cancer cervix begins at 21 years whereas according to who in all resource limited country and as we are a resource limited country so in According to WHO, the screening should begin at 30 years. So, obviously, if the option was also given that, am I going to do a pap smear? No, I am not going to do a pap smear in a daughter, right? So, then uh, even if that option was given, I would not have marked that as the answer. Then another preventive method for cancer cervix is HPV vaccines, right? Now, HPV vaccines, the age for giving HPV vaccine, the ideal age is 11 to 12 years right and HPV vaccine it can be given from 9 years to 26 years that is the age at which HPV vaccines are given in high risk individuals in high risk individuals this age group has been extended from 27 to 45 years also so if a high risk female comes and she has not been vaccinated for cancer cervix she has not received hpv vaccines then a gynecologist can give her vaccine from 27 years to 45 years as well right these are important points which you have to remember with respect to hpv vaccines then another thing i'm sure you know uh, everything about hpv vaccines that hpv vaccine is derived from l1 capsid protein right then you know that there is a bivalent vaccine cervirax and there is quadrivalent vaccine gardasil and a non-avalent vaccine gardasil 9. now india first quadrivalent vaccine is Servavac. Now, this Servavac is a quadrivalent vaccine and because it is a quadrivalent vaccine, it is going to act against HPV-16, HPV-18, HPV-6 and HPV-8. Now, this vaccine is being developed in Serum Institute of India in Pune. Now, one very important question which they have earlier asked in INI set was the WHO SAGE guidelines for HPV vaccine. So, what are the WHO SAGE guidelines for HPV vaccine? Now, our WHO SAGE guidelines say that if age of a female is between 9 to 14 years, then you have to give either a single dose or two doses of HPV vaccine, preferably a single dose, right? If age of the female is between 15 to 20 years, again, one or two doses. And if age is more than equal to 21 years, then two doses. And these two do doses have to be given at an interval of six months. Now, if your patient is HIV positive, then only you have to give three doses. HIV, HPV vaccine is given intramuscularly. HPV vaccine is contraindicated in pregnancy. And the most common side effect of HPV vaccine is syncopal attack. HPV vaccine, you know, when you are giving HPV vaccine, you don't have to test for HPV DNA. 
right so no testing of hpv dna is needed before giving this vaccine and screening should continue even after giving hpv vaccines these are very general common points about hpv vaccine hpv vaccine is not only given to uh, females it is also given to boys to protect against oral cancer penis cancer and anal cancer right so everything about hpv vaccine i'm sure all of you know just remember that hpv vaccine is derived from l1 capsid protein again that's a very very important pyq right and the most common side effect of hpv vaccine is syncopal attacks clear hpv vaccine is contraindicated in pregnancy right now now uh let's talk a little bit about the familial inheritance of gynae cancers now familial inheritance it is seen basically in ovarian cancer and in endometrial cancer right and this can be due to link syndrome so ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer may uh, the familial inheritance can be because of link syndrome what is the other name for link syndrome the other name for link syndrome is hnpcc that is hereditary non polyposis colon cancers right most common cancer if they ask you which is associated with link syndrome most common cancer which is associated with link syndrome is colon cancer second most common cancer associated with link syndrome is endometrial cancer and the other cancer which can happen due to link syndrome is ovarian cancer right what are the genes which are involved uh, in link syndrome they are mlh1 gene MSH2 and MSH6 gene, right? Now, what is the uh, a patient of Link syndrome has a lifetime risk of how much for developing endometrial cancer? So, what is the risk of developing endometrial cancer in a patient of Link syndrome? Now, this depends upon which gene has undergone mutation, but generally it is between 20 to 70 percent, and this is a wide range because uh, Link syndrome can be due to mutation in a number of genes. Right now, which type of endometrial cancer is going to happen when a patient has Link syndrome? If they are going to develop endometrial cancer, which cancer type one or type two? They are going to develop type one endometrial cancer, in other words, endometroid cancer. Now, normally, the age group for endometrial cancer is around 60 years, right? So, it's in the 6th and the 7th decade that endometrial cancer is common. But if it is happening in a patient of Link syndrome, then the age group is 46 to 54 years. That's the most common age group. That means in a patient of Link syndrome, endometrial cancer is going to happen at a younger age in comparison to a normal female, right? Then, then another gene which can lead to or oh, gynae cancers is a mutation in brca1 and brca2 gene now most commonly brca gene 1 mutation it leads to ovarian cancer right followed by endometrial cancer clear and then a third one is cowden syndrome cowden syndrome it is seen due to mutation in it is seen due to mutation in p10 gene and this p10 is located on chromosome 10 so p10 on chromosome 10 leads to cowden now what is the risk of developing endometrial cancer in a patient of cowden syndrome it is 20 to 30 percent and which type of endometrial cancer is going to happen again it will be a type 1 endometrial cancer or or an endometroid variety right another very important question is what is the gatekeeper gatekeeper gene for endometrial cancer so the gatekeeper gene for endometrial cancer is p10 gene now a very important question is that in a female with link syndrome or in a female with cowden syndrome how are you going to do screening for endometrial cancer or ovarian cancer please remember normally we don't do any screening for endometrial or ovarian cancer we do it only in females who have either link syndrome or they have cowden syndrome or they have a mutation in brca1 or brca2 gene so, in all these females, what am I going to do for endometrial cancer? I am going to do an annual surveillance of endometrial cancer. And how am I going to do that? By doing endometrial biopsy. So, every year I am going to do an endometrial biopsy. And this I am going to begin from age group 30 to 35 years. 
or I am going to begin it 5 to 10 years before any of the family member of that particular female develops cancer and it can be any cancer. So, if I have a patient of Link syndrome and any of her family member has developed cancer and that person was also a patient of Link syndrome, then at whatever age that particular family member had cancer, 5 to 10 years before that, I will start screening my patient every year by doing endometrial biopsy right that is for endometrial cancer now for ovarian cancer what i'm going to do i'm going to do a pelvic examination and ultrasound every 6 to 12 months plus minus ca 125 levels but if you ask me by doing endometrial biopsy or by doing a pelvic examination and ultrasound is this the best method for preventing endometrial or ovarian cancer in these patients no this is not the best method of preventing endometrial or ovarian cancer in these patients best method is that i should be doing a prophylactic th and bso after they have completed their childbearing or by 40 years of age so, in all these patients, you have to advise them that please complete your childbearing fast and then by definitely by 40 years of age, you should do a TH and BSO, right? TH is going to prevent endometrial cancer, BSO because in the same patients, I want to prevent ovarian cancer as well. Clear? Now, you can get a probable question like this. So, suppose if you get a probable question, which of the following has highest risk of endometrial cancer? Links in A, link syndrome, B, Cowden syndrome, C, BRCA1 mutation or BRCA2 mutation. So, your answer is going to be link syndrome. But if the same question was asked for ovarian cancer, so please remember in ovarian cancer, BRCA1 gene mutation leads to 40% chances of ovarian cancer and BRCA2 gene has 15% chances of ovarian cancer. So, in that case, my answer would have been BRCA1 mutation and not link syndrome. For endometrial cancer, the answer is link syndrome. Clear? Coming to the next question, which was on cancer cervix, a 50-year-old woman presents with foul-smelling bloody discharge per vagina mixed with mucus. On examination, a necrotizing growth can be seen in the cervix with lateral parametrium involvement. What is the management of this patient? So, the question itself is telling you that there is a growth which is present on the cervix and the growth has spread and has now involved the parametrium also. And they are asking you the management. So, first of all, let's see what stage your patient, which stage cancer cervix does your patient have. So, there are certain important stages in cancer cervix which you should be knowing. Please remember, parametrium is involved in stage 2B. Lateral pelvic wall is involved in stage 3B. If your question says there is hydrouretor or hydronephrosis, then that is again stage 3B. Bladder involvement means that there is regional metastasis. So, although ureter and kidney are involved in stage 3B, but bladder indicates, if involvement of bladder indicates that there is regional metastasis and that means stage 4A, right? Then pelvic lymph nodes are involved in stage 3C1, para-aortic in stage 3C2 and superficial inguinal lymph node indicate distant metastasis because normally cervix does not drain into superficial inguinal lymph nodes. So, whenever superficial inguinal lymph nodes are involved in cancer cervix, it means that the cancer has distantly metastasized and that means stage 4B. So, these are most important stages of cancer cervix. Ideally, for cancer cervix, you should be remembering, remembering the entire FIGO staging. But just in case you are unable to recall the entire staging because you have so many stages to remember, can, so many cancers whose staging you have to remember. So, in that case, these are the most important stages for cancer cervix which you have to remember, right? So, just now your question was saying that there is involvement of parametrium. So, this means that the stage is stage 2B. Now, when we are talking about management of cancer cervix, please remember surgery is done till stage 2A. Radiation. So, 
radiation therapy can be given in all stages but in early stages we prefer surgery until what stage are we going to do surgery still till stage 2a now in stage 2a you have 2a1 and 2a2 right the difference is in the size of the tumor in 2a1 the size of the tumor is less than 4 cm in 2a2 the size of the tumor is more than equal to 4 cm right so whenever you are doing uh, managing cancer cervix up till stage 2a the treatment of choice or the management of choice is surgery except so you have to remember two exceptions except in stage 1b3 and 2a2 right why in these two stages surgery is not the treatment of choice this is because in these two stages the tumor size is more than equal to 4 centimeters and whenever the size of the tumor is more than equal to 4 centimeters then the treatment of choice is not surgery right so that is one thing which you have to remember second thing which you have to remember is so if surgery broadly we say that surgery is the treatment of choice till stage 2a then what is the treatment of choice till stage 2b the treatment of choice from stage 2b onwards is going to be radiotherapy but because the most common variety of cancer cervix is squamous cell cancer and squamous cells are not very sensitive to radiotherapy so in order to make squamous cells sensitive to radiotherapy you give a chemotherapeutic agent which is uh, your uh, radiation sensitizer which sensitizes these squamous cells to radiotherapy and that is why instead of saying that from stage 2b to stage 4 the treatment of choice is simply radiation therapy we say that the treatment of choice is chemo radiation chemo radiation is a better answer than radio therapy right so what is the role of cisplatin over here the role of cisplatin is it acts as a radio sensitizer so from stage 2b to stage 4 the treatment of choice is chemo radiation please suppose if your question ha doesn't have the option of chemo radiation but instead it has the option of radiotherapy alone and chemotherapy alone then you are going to mark the answer as radiotherapy answer is not chemotherapy clear now in stage 1b3 and stage 2a2 what will be the treatment of choice chemo radiation clear to all of you so over here your patient has stage 2b cancer cervix so if your patient has stage 2b cancer cervix your management is going to be chemo radiation right now just a few important points which um, uh, all those who are marrow subscribers you already know but just for your information i'm just repeating these points again over here that radiotherapy in cancer cervix it can be in the form of brachytherapy or it can be in the form of teletherapy now in brachytherapy you it is an intracavitary therapy teletherapy means it is ebrt that means there is external beam radiotherapy the source of radiation is kept outside the body in teletherapy and it is kept inside the body in case of brachytherapy the isotope which is used for brachytherapy is iridium 192 whereas for teletherapy it is cesium right now whenever we have cancer cervix the first what we prefer is to shrink the size of the tumor that is why we start with teletherapy and then we give brachytherapy so as i told you in case of brachytherapy the source is kept inside the body and when it is kept inside the body it is placed at point a where is this point a point a is two centimeters above and lateral to the external os so if this over here is the external os two centimeters above and lateral to it is point a right there is another point which conventionally was taught and that point was two centimeters above and five centimeters from external os 
right so that was point b now what is the dose which you are going to give in brachytherapy you can give either high dose brachytherapy or low dose brachytherapy high dose brachytherapy means you are giving more than equal to 12 grays per hour of therapy and in low dose you are giving less than equal to 2 gray per hour whereas in case of teletherapy you have to give 50 gray to the pelvis in 25 fractions over 5 weeks now, whenever you are giving radiotherapy, please remember superficial inguinal lymph nodes are not included in the radiation field, right? Because cancer cervix does not drain into superficial inguinal lymph nodes. That is why in radiation field, we do not include superficial inguinal lymph nodes. Clear? So, these were some extra points which you need to remember on radiation therapy in case of cancer cervix. Now, question number three, a woman comes with complaints of difficulty in walking, sitting and there is pain and swelling in her perineal area. She has history of multiple sexual partners on examination. A tender swelling is present with redness on the labia and this was the image which was given. What is the likely diagnosis? Something like this was given to you in the image. So, from the question itself, it is telling me that patient has got a swelling in the perineal area. She has difficulty in walking, sitting and there is a pain in her perineal area. When the swelling was seen, rhythma was present and uh, there was tenderness which was present. Right. So, all these things point towards the diagnosis of Bartholin abscess because over here we can see that this swelling is present in between labia majora and labia minora. And whenever you have a swelling which is present in the vestibule or between labia majora and minora at the junction of anterior two third and posterior one third, then that has to be a Bartholin cyst or a Bartholin abscess. Right. So, please understand that what are the cysts which you have to keep in mind uh, whenever you get a question on vulval or vaginal cysts. So, most common cysts which you get in vagina or vulva are inclusion cysts. They are located at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position. They are deeply located and their management is excision. Please, whenever they ask you what is the most common vaginal or vulval cyst, do not say it is Bartholin cyst. It's not Bartholin cyst. They are inclusion cysts. Then we have Bartholin cyst. Bartholin cyst is going to be seen in vestibule at the junction of anterior two third and posterior one third. A Bartholin cyst is going to present to you as an intermittent painless cyst in vulva which gets aggravated on intercourse and this over here is image of Bartholin cyst. On the other hand, if your question is asking you about Gartner's cyst, Gartner's cyst is not present in the vestibule. It is not present between labia majora and labia minora. See, the Bartholin gland is present between majora and minora. And the opening of the Bartholin glands duct, it is in the vestibule at the junction of anterior two-third and posterior one-third. Right? So, this over here, so over here, if this is labia majora labia minora and this is vulva right so bartholin glands they are present in between labia majora and labia minora and their ducts are going to open in the vestibule Right, And it is the blockage of these ducts which leads to Bartholin cyst. So, the cyst has to be present either in the vestibule or it has to be present between labia majora and labia minora. On the other hand, whenever we are talking about Gartner's cyst, Gartner's cyst is found on the, on the anterior wall of vagina. Right. So, if you are seeing a cyst on the anterior wall of vagina, it means it has to be a Gartner's cyst. Right. Now, what about paraurethral cyst or the cyst in skin gland? So, if over here is urethra, these are the paraurethral glands. So, if you are getting a cyst which is there a paraurethral origin, it is very near to the urethra and it is at the place where paraurethral glands or skin glands are present, then that's a paraurethral cyst. Clear to all of you? 
yes so depending upon what image is being given to you you have to decide whether you are looking at a bartholin cyst or a gartner cyst or a para urethral gland cyst or skin gland cyst right now comes a very important thing that how do you manage bartholin cyst remember that if bartholin cyst is asymptomatic and it is less than 3 cm in size no treatment is needed only if the cyst is more than equal to 3 cm and it is asymptomatic then you have to do the treatment and then the treatment is ind incision and drainage followed by insertion of a word catheter but this is if the cyst is asymptomatic if the bartholin cyst is symptomatic then irrespective of the size you have to go for incision and drainage and insertion of word catheter similarly if you have a bartholin abscess in bartholin abscess also the management is incision and drainage followed by insertion of a word catheter now only if your question says that there is a female who has recurrent bartholin cyst and they ask you the management then whenever the word recurrent comes then the answer becomes marsupialization another word of caution over here suppose your question says that the female is more than 40 years of age or she is a menopausal female so suppose over here in the question it was that the female is 40 years of age or if she is post menopausal and she is having a bartholin cyst they give you an image of a bartholin cyst and they ask you what is the next step then please remember in this case if age is more than 40 years or if she is post menopausal or if the cyst is solid it's not a cyst but it's a solid mass right or if whatever structure is given to you the cyst or the mass it is attached to the surrounding areas it is fixed to the surrounding structures so if it is fixed to surrounding structures if any of these words are given to you and they ask you what's the next step then please do not say that the next step is ind no in this case i am suspecting a bartholin cancer and that is why i am going to do a bartholin gland biopsy clear to all of you so over here i have written for you what are the indications of bartholin biopsy so all of you read the indications mark them up but you don't apply them so if please be very careful whenever you get a question on bartholin cyst look at the age of the patient before answering that the management of bartholin cyst if it is symptomatic it is going to be ind next step if age of the patient is more than equal to 40 years is bartholin gland biopsy and not incision and drainage and once you are sure it is not a cancer then you are going to go for incision and drainage clear then comes question number 4 a 28 year old woman with multiple sexual partners comes with lower abdomen pain so okay so she has multiple sex partners that's very important and she's coming to you with history of lower abdomen pain for one month she says there is minimal discharge present and she is complaining of intermenstrual bleeding a patient who's coming to you with lower abdominal pain whose main complaint is pain and not discharge but yes she is having some discharge and she is having intermenstrual bleeding plus there is history of multiple sex partners what are you going to take this case as this is a case of pid and pid is caused by neisseria gonorrhea genital tb is generally seen in a virgin female it is not sexually transmitted right so over here the answer is going to be neisseria gonorrhea right now please understand that these days we follow the naco guidelines and we do the syndromic management of pid according to this uh, naco guidelines and syndromic management of pid you have to take complete history of a patient you have to do examination and with minimal investigations you have to start the treatment right so if a patient comes to you 
with complaint of lower abdominal pain. That's the most common complaint with which a patient is going to come to you if she has PID. Other than this, she can complain of thick purulent discharge in case of gonorrhea, thin watery discharge in case of chlamydia. She may come to you with atypical uterine bleeding like over here she's saying intermenstrual bleeding, urinary symptoms and secondary dysmenorrhea. Then you are going to do an examination in her and on examination you can get uterine tenderness or you may get adenexal tenderness or cervical motion tenderness. Now, this word cervical motion tenderness, it can be seen in ectopic pregnancy, it can be seen in PID, right? And in ectopic pregnancy, also the main complaint of the patient is uh, lower abdominal pain. That is why I said minimal investigation because if you are suspecting and if you cannot rule out ectopic pregnancy, it's better you do a urine pro uh, pregnancy test. If urine pregnancy test is positive, you are dealing with ectopic pregnancy. If it is negative, then you are dealing with PID. So, whenever I get such a history and whenever I get such examination, I say my patient is a case of lower abdominal pain syndrome and in lower abdominal pain syndrome, the kit which you, you are going to use will be a yellow kit or kit number 6. This yellow kit or kit number 6 is going to have doxycycline, it is going to have metronidazole and it is going to have cefexime. Doxycycline and metronidazole have to be given for a period of 14 days. Doxycycline dose you know 100 mgbd and metronidazole 400 mgbd. Cefexime you have to give a single shot, one day only you have to give a single tablet you have to give and you have to give 400 mgbd single tablet, right? And that has to be given for one day, right? Now, PID is sexually transmitted except genital TB and that is why whenever I have a patient of PID, I also have to treat the male partner. For male partner, the kit which we are going to use will be a grey kit or kit number 1 and this grey kit or kit number 1 has tablet cefexime and azithromycin. Cefexime is going to be 400 mg and azithromycin 1 gram. Now comes a very, very important question. This grey kit is not only used as a partner treatment in case of lower abdominal pain syndrome, but it is also used for cervicitis, right? So, if a female has cervicitis, then also you are going to use a grey kit and that brings us to the next question which was asked in NEET. But before that, I am just going to complete the indications for the grey kit. So, grey kit is used in case of cervicitis, in case of urethritis, in case of anorectal discharge and in males or in case of scrotal pain syndrome as well, right? Now, coming to the next question. So, this was a question which created a lot of controversy. A 22-year-old woman comes to STI clinic with minimal vaginal discharge. On examination, cervical erosion is seen. Which kit are you going to give to this patient? Now, please remember that whenever a patient comes to you with complaint of discharge, right, it could be a case of vaginitis or it could be a case of cervicitis, right. Now, the problem is that in case of vaginitis, you give green kit. In case of cervicitis, you give grey kit, right? So, how am I going to know whether my patient belongs to a case of vaginitis or she belongs to a case of cervicitis? Now, this is something which I had discussed in detail in the video on uh, OBGY community medicine integration. But so these videos which we took on YouTube channel where we had integrated videos, whether it was any subject integration video, a lot of effort had gone in framing questions and through these videos, through these integrated sessions, many of your concepts could be clear. So, in the video on OBGY community medicine integration video, the first question which we discussed was on syndromic management and specifically I told you that whenever you have to decide whether you have to give a kit for vaginal discharge or you have to give a kit for cervical discharge, the first thing which you have to do is a per speculum examination. Because if on per speculum examination, you are getting cervical erosion, cervical ulcer, or if you are getting a mucopurulent discharge, then that means you are dealing with a case of cervicitis, right? And 
also you should do a bimanual pelvic examination to rule out PIT. Now suppose if per speculum examination is not possible or if the patient is refusing per speculum examination then in that case I am not going to choose between grey kit and green, green, uh, green kit. In that case I am going to give her both grey kit and green kit. Right? This is something which I have told very very clearly in this video. Now over here your question is saying that on examination cervical erosion is seen. Now the moment your question says cervical erosion is seen that means it is a case of cervicitis and that means I am going to give a grey kit. Now many of you or uh, you messaged me that day and you said that ma'am uh, we marked the answer as green kit because in trichomonas we get strawberry vagina right so that is why we thought that the, you know it is a they are saying cervical erosion so it means that they are talking about trichomonas please remember that's very different in trichomonas the vagina is going to appear red in color or that is called as angry looking vagina or it is called as strawberry vagina that is not same as a cervical erosion if your question is using words like cervical erosion or a cervical ulcer, then you have to mark it as cervicitis. You have to take it as a case of cervicitis and you have to give to your patient grey kit rather than green kit. Clear to all of you? Coming to the next question. A 16 year old girl is seen for primary amenorrhea. She says she has cyclical pelvic pain every month. Now, the moment I read this cyclical abdominal pain, what am I going to think about? What is the differential diagnosis I am going to keep in mind? I am going to keep the differential diagnosis as cryptomenorrhea and I am going to think about all the causes of cryptomenorrhea. What are the three major causes for cryptomenorrhea? Number one, the most common cause is imperforate hymen. Number two, a transverse vaginal septum. Number three, vaginal atresia. Right, so we will deal with it. Just, just let's see what your question further says. On examination, a central or a suprapubic bulge can be seen in the pelvic area. Now, why are you getting the suprapelvic bulge? Because in this case, if it is a cryptomenorrhea patient, and that is what the question is telling me, probably it's a cryptomenorrhea patient. In cryptomenorrhea, what happens? In cryptomenorrhea, patient menstruates normally. But menstrual blood cannot come out and so menstrual blood is going to collect in vag vagina and it is going to eventually collect in uterus, right? So there is going to be hematometra and th be that because of which the uterus is going to be enlarged and you are going to get a suprapubic bulge. Then on per rectal examination, a swelling is seen in the anterior aspect. Now, because she is a virgin female and I don't want to do a per vaginal examination, it should not be done in a virgin female, but still I want to check the size of a uterus. I want to see whether uterus is present or not. So, whenever in a virgin female you want to check the size of a uterus, you want to see whether uterus is present or not, you should do a per rectal examination. And the question is telling you that on per rectal examination, and uh, a swelling is seen in anterior respect. So, again, what is that? That's a hematometra which you are feeling, right? So, this means that, yes, my patient has cryptomenorrhea. So, now, let's talk about more about cryptomenorrhea and let's see what is the diagnosis. So, a female at 16 years complaining of primary amenorrhea plus cyclical pain in abdomen plus suprapubic bulge plus on per rectal examination, a swelling is felt on the anterior aspect means it is a case of cryptomenorrhea, right? Now, what are the three most important causes? The most important one is imperforate hymen. That's the most important cause. Why? Because it's the most common cause of cryptomenorrhea, right? Second one is a transverse vaginal septum and a third one is vaginal atresia. Now, how to differentiate between them? Now, first thing, if your question is giving you nothing, 
right it is not telling you any other thing like this question they are not giving me revealing any other finding they are not seeing what is seen on local examination nothing else is mentioned then always choose the answer as imperforate hymen because imperforate hymen is the most common cause right so this is something which i have specifically told that whenever nothing is given to you and you have to choose why is this cryptomenorrhea happening you are going to choose imperforate hymen as the answer because that's the most common cause now if your question says that on local examination vaginal introitus cannot be seen that means vaginal opening cannot be seen this means that it is a case of vaginal atresia right so i hope all of you are well versed with the structure of female external genitalia that is the vulva so this over here is the introitus this is labia majora and inside you are going to get labia minora like these right now this area and over here will be the clitoris so this yellow color area which i am marking which anteriorly is bounded by clitoris on the sides you have labia minora and posteriorly where labia minora meet that is called as forchet so posteriorly it is bounded by forchet so this yellow area is the vulva right this vulva has got six openings number one opening this red color which i am marking is the urethral opening then we have the paraurethral glands opening then you have this opening which i am marking over here this is the introitus and then you have the opening of the bartholin glands so now when you did a local examination in a female you saw that there was no introital opening no introital opening means that it is a case of vaginal atresia right now suppose your question says no vaginal opening is present introitus is present and normally this introitus is covered by a very thin membrane which is called as hymen and this hymen has an opening through which menstrual blood comes out now your question says that when we did a local examination hymen was tensed it was blue and it was bulging right this means that you are dealing with a case of imperforate hymen in other words hymen doesn't have an opening through which menstrual blood could come out now in case of imperforate hymen when you ask your patient to cough then because hymen is very thin that cough impulse can be felt so in case of imperforate hymen on local examination you are going to get tensed bulging hymen because of the collected blood it may appear bluish in color and a cough impulse is going to be present now suppose your question says that on local examination introitus is present but the hymen is not tensed and bulging and no cough impulse was present then it means it is a case of transverse vaginal septum clear to all of you yes now the best way to differentiate between transverse vaginal septum and imperforate hymen is mri and what is the management for imperforate hymen management for imperforate hymen is you have to give a cruciate incision on the hymen clear to all of you yes so there is another question which came on prime day amenorrhea very interesting question and this was a question where if your concepts are clear you can definitely answer this question so previous year questions are not going to help you in solving this question your concepts are required for this question a 17 year old girl is seen with primary amenorrhea she has not developed breast or hair in the pubic or axillary region her height is 155 cm that's normal height weight is 48 kg she has bilateral inguinal masses on ultrasound examination there is absent uterus fallopian tube and ovary what is the most likely diagnosis now i am going to divide this question into various segments and then we are going to see what inference we are drawing and what diagnosis could it possibly be 
Now, in my classes, I repeatedly tell all of you that later on, if you take up surgery and as surgeons, if you get a female who is coming to you with bilateral inguinal hernia, right? Then please keep the possibility of undescended testes in your mind. It could be that this bilateral inguinal hernia are actually undescended testes, right? And this means that you have to keep the possibility of XY karyotype in your mind. This is clear to all of you? Yes. So, over here I have written, whenever a female presents with primary amenorrhea and your question says bilateral inguinal hernia, please keep the possibility of XY karyotype in your mind. So, I am keeping the possibility of XY karyotype in my question. So, in your questions also you are going to apply this rule. Bilateral inguinal hernia could be undescended testes, it means it could be XY karyotype. That's first thing which you are going to remember. Now, your question is saying that your patient has absent uterus, fallopian tube and ovary. So, let us deal with uterus and fallopian tube first and then we are going to go to ovary. Why I am dealing them separately is because uterus and fallopian tube are derived from Mullerian duct. Ovary comes from genital ridge. They have no relation whatsoever with each other. Right? Now, if your question is saying that there is absent uterus and fallopian tube, now, absent uterus and fallopian tube in an, is normal in XY individual, right? Why? Because Mullerian inhibiting substance is secreted by Sertoli cells. So, this means that if my patient is XY, then this is a normal thing to happen because Mullerian inhibiting substance will be present and this uh, which is secreted from Sertoli cells. Now, you bilateral uh, and absent uterus and fallopian tube in an XX individual would mean Mullerian agenesis. In an XX individual, this is going to happen whenever there is Mullerian agenesis. Now, in case of Mullerian agenesis, what is the condition of the ovary? What happens to ovary? Ovary is normal. Why? Because ovaries are derived from genital ridge. Now, my question is saying that ovary is also absent, right? So, this means it is not a case of Mullerian agenesis because if it would have been a case of Mullerian agenesis, question wouldn't have said ovary is absent. Now, if we are thinking about XY karyotype, let us put these blocks and think about XY karyotype. In an XY karyotype, gonads are testes. So, will my question say ovary is absent? Yes, my question will say ovary absent. In an XY individual, Sertoli cells are present and Sertoli cells secrete Mullerian inhibiting substance and Mullerian inhibiting substance is going to and because Mullerian inhibiting substance is present, so uterus and fallopian tube will be absent. Yes, it will be absent. So, this means that this patient is an XY individual, right? It is not an XX individual because for ovaries to develop, tell me what is needed. For ovaries to develop, you need absence of Y chromosome. So, in this patient, ovary is absent. Why? Because Y chromosome is present. The gonads are testes. That is why ovary is absent. Right? So, when I have come to this conclusion that my patient is an XY individual, now everything is falling into picture. That that is why uh, there is no ovary. That is why there are no there is no uterus. That is why there is no fallopian tube, and that is why there is bilateral inguinal hernia. So now I am going to look at these options, and I am going to see which are the options where the karyotype is XY. So. In complete androgen insensitivity, 
कैरियोटाइप इज एक्स वाई इन हाइपर गुनाडि गुनाडोट्रॉपिक हाइपोगुनाडिज्म हाइपर गुनाडोट्रॉपिक हाइपोगुनाडिज्म कुड हैपन इन अ फीमेल इट कुड हैपन इन अ मेल सो दिस कुड बी दे आर टॉकिंग अबाउट अ मेल विद हाइपर गुनाडोट्रॉपिक हाइपोगुनाडिज्म इन पी सी ओ एस द कैरियोटाइप इज एक्स एक्स एंड इन टर्नर सिंड्रोम द कैरियोटाइप इज एक्सओ इन पी सी ओ एस ओवरी विल बी प्रेजेंट इन पी सी ओ एस यूट्रस विल बी प्रेजेंट सो इट कैन नॉट बी पी सी ओ एस राइट इन टर्नर सिंड्रोम इन टर्न दिस कैन नॉट बी अ केस ऑफ टर्नर सिंड्रोम बिकॉज इन टर्नर सिंड्रोम यूट्रस इज प्रेजेंट राइट सो इन टर्नर सिंड्रोम फिलोपियन ट्यूब इज प्रेजेंट राइट सो इट कैन नॉट बी टर्नर सिंड्रोम राइट बिकॉज द कैरियोटाइप इज एक्सओ एंड आई एम लुकिंग फॉर एक्स वाई कैरियोटाइप is this clear to all of you till here that how i have come to this conclusion that this is xy individual i have come to the conclusion that this is xy individual because your question is saying bilateral inguinal mass your question is saying ovary is absent your question is saying that uterus and fallopian tube are absent so with these things i have come to the conclusion that i am dealing with xy individual so either it is a case of androgen insensitivity syndrome or it is a case of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism right now i have to decide between the two now whenever you have to decide between these two now what am i going to do now your question is also saying that there is absent breast development now if your question is saying absent breast development it cannot be androgen insensitivity syndrome in androgen insensitivity syndrome i always tell you this that xy individuals are going to have well developed breast right and they are going to have absent pubic and axillary hair right so because your patient has absent breast so that means by exclusion my answer is coming as hypergonadotropic hypogonadism right now you are going to ask me that ma'am by exclusion we have understood that this is a case of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism but tell us what is the defect in this individual explain us this so now that is why i am showing you a screenshot from a uh, leon spiroff book where we are going to read about this defect which is lh receptor defect right now when you are going to read about lh receptor defect everything will be very clear to you and some of your concepts will also become strong and i we you will revise your concepts again now lh receptor defect is seen in xy individuals right and it is a rare autosomal recessive disorder in this is disorder what happens is that there is an inactivating mutation of the lh or hcg receptors lh and hcg are functionally the same hormones and both of them act through same receptors so whether i say L uh, there is inactivating mutation of lh receptor or hcg receptor it's one and the same thing right now all of you know that it is the leydig cells which secrete testosterone leydig cells secrete testosterone in intrauterine life now the first stimulus for leydig cells to secrete testosterone is hcg right that's again a pyq very very important another thing is later on it is lh which acts on the leydig cells to secrete testosterone now in this individual who's an xy individual the problem is in lh hcg receptor now because the problem is in lh hcg receptor there will be decreased testosterone levels till here have you understood so now please understand one more thing so this over here is an xy individual this xy individual has a defect in lh hcg receptor right now because this is xy individual whenever y chromosome is present the gonads are testes right now these testes are normal testes so testes are going to have sertoli cells and they are going to have leydig cells sertoli cells are going to secrete anti-mullerian hormone or mullerian inhibiting substance and because it is going to 
secret anti mullerian hormone or mullerian inhibiting substance so mullerian duct is going to regress and that is why this individual will not have fallopian tube they will not have uterus they will not have cervix and they will not have upper vagina right now leydig cells secrete testosterone under the effect of hcg first and later on lh but problem is that there is an inactivating mutation in these leydig cells in the receptors of lh and that is why what is going to happen that is why testosterone is not going to be produced or it is going to be produced in low levels right so now if testosterone is absent what is going to happen because testosterone is absent so wolfian duct is not going to develop because wolfian duct develops under the effect of testosterone and if wolfian duct is not going to develop the male internal genitalia will not develop so this individual will not have male internal genitalia right now because testosterone is absent so what is going to happen testosterone it has a negative feedback on lh and fsh it has a negative feedback on lh and fsh so there will be increased lh levels right why not increased fsh levels this is because sertoli cells also secrete inhibin and inhibin has a negative feedback on fsh right so fsh levels may not be very high in these patients but lh levels are going to be very high in these patients right fsh will depend upon the levels of testosterone how much testosterone is present right so depending upon how much testosterone is present fsh could be normal fsh could be high but definitely lh values are going to be high in these patients right third thing it is testosterone which gets converted into dihydrotestosterone and it is this dihydrotestosterone which is responsible for masculinization of the external genitalia so if dihydrotestosterone is absent there is going to be female looking external genitalia now if there are female looking external genitalia so obviously these testes are not going to descend and they will be undescended testes and these undescended testes they present as bilateral inguinal hernia so these individuals who have female looking external genitalia are going to at birth they are going to be taken as a female child by looking at the external genitalia and when they are going to grow up parents are going to expect them to menstruate parents are going to expect them to have breast development now because testosterone is absent there is testosterone is not getting converted into estrogen in androgen insensitivity syndrome what happens in androgen insensitivity syndrome there is excessive testosterone right it, the problem is not in testosterone production the problem is that the individual is insensitive to testosterone right so that excessive testosterone gets converted into estrogen and that leads to breast development in this individual over here who has lh receptor defect there is no testosterone no estrogen right so if there is no testosterone no estrogen so no breast development and it is testosterone which is re responsible for pubic hair and axillary hair so if there is no testosterone what is going to happen at puberty there is no testosterone because there is no testosterone so no pubic hair no axillary hair all of you know that in females also for development of pubic hair and axillary hair it is androgens which are responsible if there is no testosterone so there is no aromatization into estrogen and obviously if there is no aromatization into estrogen so there is no breast development right and there they are going to come to you with complain of primary amenorrhea because they are not going to menstruate obviously they will not menstruate they don't have any ovary they don't have any uterus they don't have estrogen they don't have progesterone so they are not going to menstruate right 
So, this is what is LH receptor defect over here and in this case because the levels of LH are high and because testosterone is absent, so there is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Clear to all of you? Yes? So, this is a case of hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Yes. Now, over here, I have included screenshots from uh, uh, Spiroff, right, from Leon Spiroff, so that you all can read about this defect. So, please uh, just, you also take a screenshot and read about this from Leon Spiroff as well, right. So, take a screenshot of it quickly and this is the continuation. Take a screenshot from here as well, right. This is LH receptor defect. Another very important thing where you get confused. Now, one more XY karyotype which presents as primary amenorrhea. One was androgen insensitivity syndrome. Androgen insensitivity syndrome patients are presenting with primary amenorrhea. And just now I told you in androgen insensitivity syndrome, what are you going to get? Breast development will be pre uh, present. Now, another differential diagnosis which you have to keep in mind whenever you have an XY karyotype and patient is coming to you with primary amenorrhea that is Swyer's syndrome. Now what happens in Swyer's syndrome? In Swyer's syndrome they are XY individuals. The problem in them is that the testes are dysgenetic. They have dysgenetic testes. Please remember it is these dysgenetic testes which have very high chances of malignancy. Not only the dysgenetic testes, undescended testes also have high chances of malignancy. So whenever I have an XY individual with undescended testes, I have to go for gonadectomy, right? So, here the testes are dysgenetic in Swire's syndrome. Now, if the testes are dysgenetic, what does this mean? This means Sertoli cell will not function and Lydic cell will not function because Sertoli cells are also dysgenetic, Lydic cells are also dysgenetic. So, if Sertoli cells are not functioning, there will not be any anti-Mullerian hormone and if there won't be any anti-Mullerian hormone in Swire's syndrome, what is going to be present? Mullerian duct is going to be present. Right, and if Mullerian duct is present, so what is going to happen? Because Mullerian duct is present, that is why uterus, cervix, and fallopian tube are all present. Right, because Sertoli cells are dysgenetic, so Sertoli cells will not secrete anti Mullerian hormone. In other words, Mullerian duct will grow, and so uterus will be present, cervix will be present, fallopian tube will be present, upper part of vagina would be present. Now, because Leydig cells are dysgenetic, so there won't be any testosterone and because there won't be any testosterone, so there will be no Wolfian duct and if there will be no Wolfian duct, so there will be no male internal genital organs. Again, if there is no testosterone, the negative feedback on GnRH that is LH and FSH, GnRH, LH and FSH will be absent. So, the levels of LH and FSH both will be very high. LH will be high, FSH will be high. In these individuals, FSH levels will definitely be high. Why? Because Sertoli cells are also dysgenetic. So, Sertoli cells are not secreting inhibin. So, there is no inhibin, no testosterone. So, definitely LH and FSH levels are very high. Number three, because there is no testosterone, so what is going to happen? There will be no dihydrotestosterone and that is why there will be female external genitalia, right? If there is female external genitalia and testes, testes don't have any space to go and so they remain as undescended testes. Now, at puberty, now because they have female external genitalia, they are taken as a female child at birth. Now, imagine what is going to happen at puberty. At puberty, they have uterus but they don't have any ovary, right? So, they are going to come to you as a case of primary amenorrhea. Is breast development going to be present? No, because no testosterone, so no aromatization, so no breast development. No testosterone, so no pubic hair, no axillary hair. Clear to all of you? So, in case of Swire's syndrome, there is no pubic hair, no breast development, no axillary hair, but then difference is 
that in Sertoli, in Swire's syndrome, if this question would have been of Swire's syndrome, the question would have mentioned that uterus is present, fallopian tube is present. Because question is saying uterus absent, fallopian tube absent, that is why I am telling you this is LH receptor defect. In Swire's syndrome also there is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. So, whenever they are talking about hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, you have to keep both the possibilities in mind. If there is hypergonadotropic hypogonadism with uterus present, hypergonadotropic so, XY individual who has hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and your question says uterus is present, right? Breast development is absent, right? And your question says axillary hair and pubic hair are absent. Then your answer becomes Swire's syndrome, right? If your question says XY who has hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, right? And uterus is absent, fallopian tube is absent, breast development is absent axillary hair and pubic hair are absent all that is same that axillary hair and pubic hair are absent right now your answer becomes swa uh, lh receptor defect clear to all of you so please just don't mug up the answer as hypergonadotropic hypogonadism that is why i have told you this in detail so that next time if you get a question you do not just simply mug up the answers you know the concept behind those pyqs also yes Coming to the next question, a woman is to undergo a complete laparoscopic hysterectomy. She wants to know if there is any disadvantage to the procedure. What are the disadvantages of laparoscopic over open surgery? Now, I am sure this is a very easy question and common sense is going to help you do this question. Does laparoscopy have a prolonged recovery time? No. Does laparoscopy lead to increased bleeding? No. In laparoscopy, is there increased pain? No. So, it means the answer is not knowing the extent of thermal burns, right? So, coming to the next question, now this question is based on hysteroscopy. The question says, during the removal of a submucous fibroid during hysteroscopy, a fluid deficit of 2000 ml is estimated in a patient. What is the immediate complication of this? Now, before I tell you uh, details about hysteroscopy, just one or two things which I want you to know in general. See, uh, first of all, which type of submucous fibroid do you remove hysteroscopically? It is type 0 and type 1. Type 0 and type 1 submucous fibroids can be removed hysteroscopically. Neither can you remove type 2 submucous fibroid hysteroscopically. Neither can you remove intramural nor subserous fibroid hysteroscopically. For type 2, for intramural and subserous, you will have to go for laparoscopic hysterectomies. Right Now, the other thing, what do you understand by this thing that there is a 2000 ml of fluid deficit? See, always I tell you that uterine cavity is a potential cavity. What do you mean by that? This means that only if, you know, there is something inside the cavity, then the, there is a distension of the cavity. Otherwise, normally, the anterior and the posterior wall of the uterus, they remain opposed to each other. When something comes in between them to distend the cavity, then only the walls get separated from each other. Now, if uterine cavity is a potential cavity and if I have to put hysteroscope and I have to see inside the uterus, I will have to put some distension media so that the, you know, the walls, they get separated from each other and then only I will be able to look properly inside the uterus, right? So, whenever I am doing hysteroscopy, I have to put some distension media. 
right now during hysteroscopy when you put the distension media inside you have to monitor that how much fluid has gone inside and how much fluid has come back reason being because a part of the fluid which you are a distension media or whatever fluid you are using will get absorbed by the patient's body right so the amount of fluid which is coming out minus the amount which you had so the amount of fluid which you had put in minus the amount of fluid which is coming out is equal to the amount of fluid which has been absorbed by the patient's body simple the amount of fluid which i am putting in suppose that is 5 liters and when i am calculating and i am seeing how much fluid is coming out i see only 4 liters fluid comes out so this means that 1 liter of fluid has been absorbed by the patient's body now instead of saying that 1 liter of fluid has been absorbed by the patient's body i will say that there is a fluid deficit of 1 liter Fluid deficit of 1 litre means 1 litre of fluid has been absorbed by the patient's body. There is a difference of 1 litre in the amount of or the volume of fluid which has gone inside the uterine cavity and the volume which has come out. Is this much clear to all of you? Right? Now, a few basic points on hysteroscopy. These are the points which are there in uh, Maro notes also. Right? So, histros for hysteroscopy, the position of the patient should be lithotomy position. Pain for pain relief, you can give IV sedation and analgesia, or you can give use epidural as well. The distension media, see, uh, hysteroscopy can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Now, distension media could be carbon dioxide. If you are using carbon dioxide as a distension media, then you can only perform diagnostic hysteroscopy and not therapeutic hysteroscopy. So, carbon dioxide is used only for diagnostic but not for therapeutic hysteroscopy. Right? Then the second kind of media which you can use is electrolyte rich media for example normal saline and ringolactate or you may use electrolyte deficient media like 1.5 percent glycine or 3 percent sorbitol or 5 percent mannitol right now the pressure inside the uterus normally should be 75 to 80 millimeters of mercury maximum it can be 150 millimeters of mercury now what is the difference between using an electrolyte rich distension media and electrolyte deficient distension media number one is electrolyte rich distension media can only be used with bipolar instruments you cannot use an electrolyte rich media with unipolar cautery reason being that it is going to you know dissipate the electrolyte and there is going to be burns and shock so you can never use electrolyte rich media with unipolar instruments or unipolar cautery electrolyte rich media can only be used with bipolar instruments whereas electrolyte deficient media can be used both with bipolar and unipolar cauterizations or unipolar and bipolar instruments right now overall a common complication of hysteroscopy is that when you are putting a distension media inside the uterus it may lead to uterine perforation so whether you are using electrolyte rich media or electrolyte deficient media this can be a, com a complication that is a complication which is seen in both the cases now in case of electrolyte deficient media a specific complication which can happen is water intoxication right so it is electrolyte deficient only you are giving uh, you know sorbitol or mannitol or glycine and this can lead to water intoxication a patient who has water intoxication will present to you with nausea vomiting and headache so that can be a specific complication of electrolyte deficient media water intoxication a third complication which uh, a second complication which can be specific to electrolyte deficient media is these electrolyte deficient media most of them are hypoosmolar right and because they are hypoosmolar they can lead to hyponatremia except for one electrolyte deficient media which is not hypoosmolar but is isoosmolar and that is mannitol other than mannitol, electrolyte deficient medias are hypoosmolar and they can lead to hyponatremia. And whenever your question says that while performing hysteroscopy, a patient had delirium and confusion, 
this means you were using electrolyte deficient media and that too either you were using sorbitol or glycine because hyponatremia is a complication of electrolyte deficient media right now in case of electrolyte rich media if there is a fluid deficit of 2.5 liters then you should stop the procedure whereas if it is electrolyte deficient media you should stop the procedure as soon as the fluid deficit becomes 1 liter why because electrolyte deficient media may if even you know if 1 liter of electrolyte deficient media is absorbed that can lead to your fluid water retention right water intoxication clear so now over here this question tell me what do you think the patient has had she has had fluid deficit of 2000 ml that means 2 liter of whatever distension media was being used has been absorbed by her body and if 2 liter of fluid they haven't mentioned whether it was electrolyte deficient or electrolyte rich but if 2 liters of fluid is absorbed what do you expect acute tubular necrosis thromboembolism pulmonary edema or DIC so common sense tells me I am going to have maybe signs of water intoxication and that means pulmonary edema clear to all of you yes hysteroscopy is very important and you got one more question on hysteroscopy this time again a little tricky question for which of the following procedures in the given OT list can you do hysteroscopy right so over here you were confused between two options see for sub fibroid just now I told you sub fibroid is managed laparoscopically Tubal ligation is done laparoscopically with the help of tubal ring applicators, right? Then we have polyps and Asherman syndrome. Now, what you people do is you just read your questions very quickly and then you get confused. Should I mark polyp or should I mark Asherman syndrome? In Asherman syndrome, ma'am told me that you have to go for hysteroscopic adhesiolysis. And in polyp also, the management is hysteroscopic polypectomy. But, but so read the question carefully. They are saying cervical polyp. For a cervical polyp, you don't need hysteroscopy. For a cervical polyp, you just need a ring forceps and you have to avulse the polyp. You, the stalk of the polyp from the base over here, you are going to avulse the polyp and then send this polyp for histopathological examination. If instead of cervical polyp, your question would have said endometrial polyp, then I would have gone for hysteroscopy. So again, this is ruled out. Now your answer is Asherman syndrome and all of you know that in Asherman syndrome what are you going to do? You are going to go for hysteroscopic adhesiolysis and simultaneously you don't want the walls to come in contact with each other. So you are going to put a pediatric Foley's catheter and you are going to give estrogen and progesterone to your patient to build the endometrium. Clear? So answer over here is Asherman syndrome. Coming to the next question, a 23-year-old woman accompanied by her mother-in-law came to the infertility clinic. She has been having regular intercourse for six months, but she is not able to conceive what is the next step. Now, first of all, see the age of the patient, 23-year-old woman, and she is having intercourse for six months. Now, tell me, how do you define infertility? Infertility is defined that if in spite of having regular intercourse for a period of one year unprotected intercourse for a period of one year if a female is unable to conceive then you start the investigations for infertility except if age of the patient is more than 35 years if age of your patient is more than 35 years then the investigations should begin after six months if age is less than 35 you have to begin the investigations after one year and if age of your patient is more than 40 years then you can begin the investigations as soon as after three months right less than 35 years that's a normal thing so you're going to say one year more than 35 years six months more than equal to 40 years then three months right so over here patient is very young 23 year old so over here what am i going to tell her i'm going to tell her that reassure and see her after six months i'm going to tell her look no, try for six more months and still if you don't conceive please come to me right so that is the answer over here now suppose the age over here was given as 
37 years. Now, if age was given as 37 years and now she has been trying for 6 months and she is unable to conceive, then what would I have done? Then I would have gone for 3 basic investigations. What are the 3 basic investigations which you have to do in all patients who are coming to you with infertility? Number 1, semen analysis. Number two, in order to check whether there is any ovulatory dysfunction or not, you are going to check her serum progesterone levels on day 21 of the cycle. And number three, in order to check the patency of the tubes, you are going to do hysterosalpingography. So, these are three investigations which you have to do in all couples who are coming to you with infertility. Clear to all of you? Yes. So, then in that case, yes, my answer would have been I would have gone for semen analysis for the husband. But, but because her age is 23, I am going to reassure and I am going to see her after 6 months. A pretty easy question. Next question, again, this is a very typical ultrasound which we keep on showing in classes also and in marrow videos also. A 24-year-old woman who is being treated for infertility with human menopausal gonadotropins. So, she has infertility. She was being treated with HMG. She comes with complaint of sudden abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, breathlessness. Now, even with this kind of history, even if they won't have shown us the ultrasound image, we would have marked the answer as ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome because number one, uh, she was being given HMG. Number two, she is coming to you with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting and breathlessness. So, this point towards ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Now, in this ultrasound, what you are seeing? In this ultrasound, you are seeing multiple follicles which are very big in size and that is why I am calling it as ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. I am not calling it as PCOS. In PCOS, the size of the follicles is between 2 to 9 millimeters in size and in this ultrasound, the uh, follicle size is much more than 2 to 9 millimeters. Then in PCOS, PCOS does not explain that why is your patient having abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, breathlessness. Clear? So, my answer over here is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Now, important points about this is if your ultrasound is showing big size follicles, then please consider ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome as a differential diagnosis. Your patient will have history of HMG injection. Right, and your patient here also has HMG injection. Remember, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is most commonly seen with HMG human menopausal gonadotropin. Now, there are certain risk factors in a female who is going to have OHSS. Now, these risk factors I want you to learn. Right. So, please remember these risk factors. Young females are more likely to have OHSS. So, over here, see your patient is a 24-year-old female. So, she is li more likely to have OHSS. Number two, thin females are more likely to have OHSS. PCOS patients are more likely to have OHSS. Now, I want you to remember this thin females here because most of the times in OHSS, OHSS is more common in PCOS females and PCOS is more common in obese females. So, we come to a conclusion that OHSS is also more common in obese females, but that's not correct. OHSS is more common in thin females. Then OHSS will be more common if ovary has a large number of follicles. In other words, there is increased antral follicle count. And all of you know that the follicles, the small follicles, the preantral follicles, they release anti-mullerian hormones. So the chances of OHSS are going to be high in those females in whom anti-mullerian hormone levels are high and they are more than 3.3. Similarly, Chances of OHSS will be high if during IVF cycle, the estrogen levels are more than 2500 picograms or if you are using HCG for luteal support or if patient becomes pregnant. Right? See, in OHSS, what happens is, in OHSS, the number of follicles are increased and there are huge size follicles which develop and this happens because of HMG. Right? So, now presence of these follicles will not lead to OHSS. Problem will not happen if these big, big follicles are present in the ovary. If these big follicles are present in the ovary, your patient will not have any symptoms. Right? 
problem happens that when you have given HMG and you are seeing that the size of follicles has increased, right? You are seeing that the estrogen levels have become more than 2500 picograms and still you give HCG as ovulation trigger. Now these follicles will burst and from these follicles vascular endothelial growth factor will come out and that is going to start the entire cascade of events. This means that if I have to prevent OHSS from happening, I should never give HCG before checking anti-mullerian hormone levels, before checking estrogen levels, before doing an antral follicle count. Right, so 100% you can prevent OHSS if you do not give this injection HCG, right. Now, if OHSS is happening because you gave injection HCG to the patient, right, so this is this kind of OHSS is called as early OHSS and this happens within 8 days of giving injection HCG, right. Now, suppose there is a female in whom in the ovary, follicles were present, a few follicles were small, a few follicles were big and this was not a risk factor for OHSS, so you gave injection HCG. Now these follicles ruptured and by chance your patient conceived, right? Now uh, you did an IVF and everything was normal, your patient has conceived. Now when your patient conceives, your patient, you all know that in pregnancy, HCG, more HCG is released. This is the endogenous HCG which is released during pregnancy. So, nothing happened when you gave exogenous HCG because at that time, many follicles were not ripe and not many follicles ruptured, right? But whatever ruptured, you did an IVF and the IVF was successful. Now this patient, because she has conceived, now she is producing endogenous HCG. She is producing HCG from syncytiotrophoblast. Now whatever follicles are remaining in the ovary, this HCG acts on them and those follicles burst and they release a lot of v vascular endothelial growth factor. So, this kind of OHSS is happening because, or because the patient became pregnant, right? So, pregnancy is also a risk factor for OHSS and this OHSS which happens because patient has become pregnant is going to happen, is called as late OHSS. This late OHSS happens because of endogenous HCG and why it is called as late because it, because it is going to happen after 8 days of the injection HCG. This injection HCG did not lead to this OHSS, right? So, it happens after 8 days of injection HCG because of this endogenous HCG which is produced during pregnancy, right? So, please remember Early OHSS, so a few important points which I am going to tell you about OHSS now, right? But before that, one important thing which I want to tell you about PCOS. Now, in PCOS, all of you know the Rot Rotterdam criteria, right? In Rotterdam criteria, one of the criteria was ultrasound criteria. And what was the ultrasound criteria for diagnosing PCOS? The ultrasound criteria was if there are 12 or more than 12 follicles which are 2 to 9 millimeters in size if they are present in one or both the ovaries then that is an ultrasound criteria for PCOS and this was given by Rotterdam. Recently the European society and American society both of them now they say that it is not more than equal to 12 follicles which are needed for ultrasound diagnosis of PCOS. Now the number of follicles which are needed for ultrasound diagnosis of PCOS are more than equal to 20 follicles. So you are going to make an ultrasound diagnosis of PCOS if you are getting more than equal to 20 follicles which are 2 to 9 millimeters in size then you are going to say this is polycystic ovary on ultrasound. Rotterdam said 12 follicles, 
now european society and american societies are saying more than equal to 20 follicles clear to all of you but the size of the follicles it is same it they should be 2 to 9 millimeters in size right now ovulation induction drug with maximum risk of ohss just now i told you it is hmg ovulation induction drug which has no risk of ohss that is letrozole what is the triggering factor for ohss injection hcg early ohss means it is happening at less than 8 days after giving injection hcg late ohss means it is happening more than equal to 8 days after giving injection hcg how does a patient of ohss come to you she comes to you with complain of abdominal discomfort dis distension nausea vomiting breathlessness now there is a grading for ohss i don't want you to remember the entire grading unless and until you are looking for a very 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 good rank in general i want you to remember about the grade 3 ohss grade 3 ohss means if on ultrasound ascites is present if on ultrasound ascites is present that is called as grade 3 ohss right what is the management of mild ohss M management of mild ohss you don't need to admit them you just have to give them analgesics and you have to tell them to avoid strenuous activities why to avoid strenuous activities because their ovaries have got huge follicles right so it can undergo torsion if they do some strenuous exercise like physical activities right and you are going to tell them to avoid intercourse then if it is moderate to uh, severe OHSS, you have to admit these patients, you have to give them IV fluids, you have to check their electrolyte, uh, you have to maintain their electrolyte balance and you have to give them prophylaxis for thrombosis. Please remember, if your patient has pregnancy and she has symptoms of OHSS, if she is pregnant and she has symptoms of OHSS, then irrespective of whether it is mild, whether it is moderate or whether it is severe, you have to admit her, right? So, as I told you, pregnancy can lead to late OHSS. So, if your patient who is pregnant has symptoms of OHSS, irrespective of whether it is mild, whether it is moderate, whether it is severe, please admit your patient. Clear to all of you? Coming to question number 13. So, from here we begin discussion of questions which were asked in OBS. Now, a primary gravida patient presents to you in an early pregnancy with anemia. She is 7 weeks pregnant as seen on ultrasound. Her hemoglobin is 9%. When should you start iron supplements in her? First of all, if her hemoglobin, any pregnant females, at whatever period of gestation, if her hemoglobin is less than 11 gram percent, then you call it as anemia in pregnancy, right? Now, uh, when we are talking about anemia mukt bharat program, this anemia mukt bharat program is for preventing anemia. Is the aim of this is to prevent anemia, right? And to prevent anemia. Iron folic acid tablets should be started from 4th month, right? But then this is not to treat anemia, right? If your patient has anemia, you have to give her treatment. You don't have to give her prophylaxis. Prophylaxis, that is anemia mukt bharat program, it is done for females who don't have any anemia, right? But we know that their hemoglobin is going to drop because of hemodilution during pregnancy. So, to prevent physiological anemia, we, give, we do give them iron folic acid from 4th month of pregnancy, right? But if your patient already has anemia, you are not going to wait till 14 weeks to give her treatment for uh, anemia, right? So, whenever there is anemia in first trimester, uh, all this I have made you write in your marrow notes. Whenever there is anemia in first trimester, you have to look at the hemoglobin of the patient. If hemoglobin of patient is less than 5 gram percent or if your patient has congestive heart failure, signs of CHF, then the treatment of choice becomes blood transfusion. But if your patient's hemoglobin is more than 11 grams percent and there is no sign of congestive heart failure, in that case, the treatment of choice is oral iron therapy, right? So, if hemoglobin is less than 5 gram percent or if there is 
signs of heart failure right in first trimester then the management is blood transfusion now if hemoglobin is more than 5 gram percent and there are no signs of chf then the management is immediately you have to start iron therapy you are not going to wait for anything blood transfusion also immediately iron therapy also immediately remember parenteral iron is contraindicated parenteral iron is contraindicated in pregnancy right and i also gave you an example i gave you an mcq and i asked you what is the answer going to be so in your marrow videos i have told you a 30 year old primary gravida at 10 weeks of pregnancy presents for routine antenatal examination her cardiovascular examination finding is normal her hemoglobin is 6.4 gram percent on peripheral blood smear microcytic hypochromic anemia can be seen nestrov test is negative best line of management is and i told you that you are going to give her oral iron therapy immediately right why have i given this nestrov test is uh, negative nestrov test negative means your patient doesn't have thalassemia because if your patient has thalassemia if your question any time if your question is saying you know whenever your question says nestrov test positive or if your question says there are signs of heart failure right or if your question says unstable vitals then your answer and your patient has anemia then your answer always is blood transfusion irrespective of gestational age so if any of these three things are mentioned your answer has to be blood transfusion in first trimester an additional criteria is hemoglobin less than 5 grams so in first trimester if hemoglobin is less than 5 grams then also we go for blood transfusion right so over here your heme, the patient's hemoglobin is 9 gram percent patient is 7 weeks pregnant so when am i what am i going to do i'm going to start her oral iron therapy when am i going to start immediately and over here immediately is 8 to 10 weeks clear also i'm going to make you revise management of anemia in pregnancy in second and third trimester right now whenever your patient has anemia in second and third trimester first of all you have to see whether your patient has mild to moderate anemia or she has severe anemia severe anemia means hemoglobin less than 7 gram percent right now if your patient's hemoglobin is more than 7 gram percent that means she is either mild or she is a case of moderate anemia in mild to moderate anemia you have to check the gestational age of your patient if gestational age is less than 34 weeks then i'm going to answer it as oral iron and whenever i'm giving oral iron to treat anemia i have to give two tablets of iron folic acid right so for treatment of anemia the dose which i have to use is two tablets clear now if gestational age is more than 34 weeks and she's a case of mild to moderate anemia then i'm going to give parenteral iron remember whenever you are giving oral iron or whenever you are giving parenteral iron after how many weeks should you check her hemoglobin the increase in hemoglobin after giving oral iron and parenteral iron will be seen after three weeks so there is no point in checking her hemoglobin before three weeks so ideally you should check it after a month whether you are giving oral iron or whether you are giving parenteral iron check her hemoglobin after one month so suppose your patient had mild to moderate anemia and her gestational age was less than 34 weeks you gave her oral iron and after a month you checked her hemoglobin and you saw that her hemoglobin doesn't increase this means that your patient is non-compliant and in that case you will put her on parenteral iron right now comes the category of severe anemia if any time in your question they give you in second or third trimester hemoglobin is less than seven now this less than seven is again divided into two categories less than five and between five to six point nine just now i told you whenever hemoglobin is less than five what is the management blood transfusion right so over here you are going to write down 
whenever hemoglobin is less than 5 grams in any trimester you are going to give her blood transfusion now if hemoglobin is between 5 to 6.9 in second and third trimester then again check her gestational age if gestational age is less than 34 weeks parenteral iron if it is more than equal to 34 weeks blood transfusion clear to all of you yes now please remember the cut off value which we are using for blood transfusion is that whenever hemoglobin is less than 5 g at any gestational age we are doing blood transfusion but if they ask you how do you define very severe anemia do not say less than 5 g no very severe anemia is hemoglobin less than 4 g severe anemia is hemoglobin less than 7 g very severe is less than 4 g and 5 g is the cut off value for using blood transfusion if hemoglobin is less than 5 g at any gestational age you have to give blood transfusion clear to all of you yes next question a pregnant woman comes to a clinic she already has twins by normal delivery what is our obstetric formula so this is a direct pyq which was asked now all of you know gravity is gravida is the number of time a female conceives including this pregnancy so this patient earlier had a twin pregnancy and now she is pregnant again right so this is gravida to coming to parity parity is the number of previous pregnancy that is the difference between gravida and parity in parity it is only the number of previous pregnancies which you have to count so parity is the number of previous pregnancies which went beyond the period of viability and period of viability in india is more than equal to 28 weeks now your question is saying that she has twins that means that it, in that case it means that they they had gone beyond the period of viability that is why they are alive right so it is previous one pregnancy went beyond the period of viability remember twins are a result of single conception so whenever you are counting twins or triplets they are taken as one right except where do you count twins as two you are going to count so always twins or triplets always twins and triplets are counted as one except except what is that except where is twins counted as two twins is taken as two triplets is taken as three when you are counting the number of living children whenever you are counting the number of living children then twins will be taken as two and triplets will be taken as three but then whenever you are talking about parity in parity whenever you are saying counting twins or triplets you are going to count them as a result of single conception so you are going to count them as one right now now please note bachcho the gt pal system now in gt pal system g stands for gravida right and you know what is gravida the number of two uh, pre times a female has conceived including present pregnancy right t stands for number of previous term pregnancies term deliveries how do you define a term delivery any delivery which is happening at more than equal to 37 weeks then p now p here doesn't stand for parity in gt pal p stands for i'm sure all of you know it is the number of previous preterm deliveries and how do you define a preterm delivery between any delivery which is happening between 20 weeks to 36 weeks plus 6 days then a stands for what does a stand for a stand for number of abortions which includes ectopic which includes molar pregnancy so any pregnancy loss which is happening at less than 20 weeks and l stands for the number of living children and this is the place a uh, number of living children at present so this is the place where twins are going to be counted as two triplets are going to be counted as two now this question was easy because they asked you to write gravida and parity now suppose they had given you the same history and they had asked you about her gt pal score so what would her gt pal score be 
gravida she is 2 then term pregnancies now they have said it, she was twins were delivered by normal delivery and suppose they had given at 35 weeks suppose your question said that the twin delivery happened at 20 uh, 35 weeks so number of term deliveries previous term deliveries 0 number of previous preterm deliveries 1 number of abortion 0 number of living children Right? So, then this would have been her GT PAL score. Clear to all of you? Yes? Coming to the next question. A 27 year pregnant woman G3P2L2, right, presents to you at 36 weeks plus 6, 36 plus 6 weeks, right? So, I am just making it a little lighter. Ultrasound done shows the fetus is in transverse lie. Liker is adequate, placenta is normal, she has no risk factors, both her previous deliveries were normal vaginal deliveries, how will you manage this patient? So, this is a question where your patient has come to you at 36 weeks plus 6 days, her, there is adequate liker and there are no risk factors and it is a case of transverse lie. You tell me what are you going to do? I have told you so many times that whenever there is a case of transverse lie patient who is coming to you and at antenatal visit, then at more than equal to 36 weeks, you are going to do external cephalic version. Right? Now, important thing about external cephalic version is that before you do an external cephalic version always you have to do ultrasound why do you have to do ultrasound number one to confirm the lie of the patient number two to see that the liker is adequate number three to confirm that it's a single pregnancy and to see that there is no gross anomaly right external cephalic version it's an opd procedure no anesthesia is required you just need to give tocolytics to relax the uterus and the tocolytic which you are going to use will be terbutaline the other important thing which you have to remember is that if you are doing this procedure in rh negative female then do not forget to give forget to give anti d now after external cephalic version you are not going to do induction of labor and external cephalic version should be done under continuous fetal monitoring right external cephalic version the prerequisites for external cephalic version and simultaneously the absolute contraindications for external cephalic version this, are, this is how i teach you that uh, you know at what time should you do external cephalic version it should be done at more than equal to 36 weeks it is usually done at 37 weeks right now liker should be adequate that's a prerequisite in other words if there is oligohydramnios then that becomes an absolute contraindication then membranes should be intact. If membranes are intact, then only the liker will be adequate. In other words, ruptured membranes are absolute contraindication. It can be done in early labor. That means during latent phase of labor when the membranes are intact. In other words, active phase of labor. If a patient with transverse lie is coming to you in active phase of labor, then that's an absolute contraindication for external cephalic version. It can be done only in case of singleton pregnancy. In other words, twin and multifetal pregnancy are absolute contraindications for external cephalic version. Then fetal heart rate should be normal on CTG. In other words, abnormal fetal heart rate on CTG is an absolute contraindication or if you are getting gross congenital anomalies of the fetus then that's an absolute contraindication or anomalies um, you know you subseptate uterus by coronate uterus again these are absolute contraindications then there should be no contraindication for vaginal delivery that's an absolute prerequisite that's a prerequisite for external cephalic version so there shouldn't be any contraindication for vaginal delivery in other words if you are a patient has placenta previa or if your patient has contracted pelvis then that's an absolute contraindication for external cephalic version a few relative contraindications also which i make you write are previous lses pih heart disease in the mother or suspected iugr these are relative contraindications but you have to remember prerequisites and absolute contraindications clear to all of you so over here the answer was external cephalic version now a woman presents to you at 36 weeks of gestation with complaint of breathlessness and excessive abdominal distension fetal movements are normal 
fetal parts are felt but not that well fetal heartbeat is heard but it is muffled symphysiofrontal height is 41 cm her abdomen is tense but not tender what is the most probable diagnosis first tell me why have they mentioned uh, about symphysiofrontal height see symphysiofrontal height is equal to the period of gestation right so please remember that in all pregnant females between 24 to 36 weeks you have to measure the symphysiofrontal height and symphysiofrontal height in these patients is equal to the period of gestation right now if your there is a discrepancy in symphysiofrontal height and period of gestation then there is that means there is some problem for example if symphysiofrontal height is more than the period of gestation so number one it could be wrong dates number two it could be that the patient's bladder is full that is why we say that whenever you are examining a patient uh, an antenatal patient always you have to tell her to empty her bladder then it could be a case of multifetal pregnancy it could be polyhydramnios polyhydramnios is seen in diabetic patients so it could be a diabetic patient it could be concealed variety of abrupt show then height of the uterus more than period of gestation is seen in molar pregnancies in macrosomias also right now if height is less than the period of gestation then again it could mean wrong dates it could mean iugr it could mean intrauterine death of the fetus iugr is seen in pih so it could be seen in pih then oligohydramnios and premature rupture of membranes these are all causes where height of the uterus is less than the period of gestation now in your question height of the uterus is in you the question is that symphysiofundal height is more than period of gestation and it is more by 5 centimeters. Significant is increase is when it is the, there is a discrepancy of more than equal to 3 centimeters, right? So, if there is a discrepancy of more than equal to 3 centimeters, then that means there is some problem. Now, uh, now we have to come to the problem. See, placental abruption may if it is a concealed variety of abruptio placenta definitely that can lead to height of the uterus more than the period of gestation but all of you know that in abruption uterus is not uterus is tender in your question it is saying uterus is not tender right number one number two in case of abruptio you should have either history of trauma or history of PIH these are the fine you know generally uh, a patient of abruptio will have some reason for that kind of bleeding number three then there will be patient is going to come to you with complaint of bleeding and pain in abdomen now in this case patient is not coming to you with bleeding and pain in abdomen she is coming to you with breathlessness and excessive abdominal distension so, all these findings are going against abruptio. Then on uh, per abdominal examination, uterus should be tensed. Here, uterus is not tensed. In case of abruptio, fetal heart sounds generally will not be heard. Fetal heart sounds will, there will be fetal distress or the fetal heart sounds will be absent. Over here, fetal heart sounds are present right so these are the points which are going against abruptio so abruptio is not my diagnosis now comes polyhydramnios now with the help of polyhydramnios can i explain all this yes i can explain all this because if there is going to be polyhydramnios mother is going to come to me with breathlessness and excessive abdominal distension Fetal heart sounds will be heard, but they will be muffled. Patients will, uterus will be distended, but it will not be tender, right? So, typically, this is a case of polyhydramnios, right? So, my answer is going to be polyhydramnios because this is how a patient of polyhydramnios presents to us, right? Okay, next question. A woman presents to you with six weeks of amenorrhea, complaining of bleeding PV and slight abdominal pain. Urine pregnancy test is slightly positive and HCG is 2800 international unit. HCG 2800. Okay, now patient has pain, bleeding PV, amenorrhea. There is a triad of amenorrhea plus bleeding PV plus abdominal pain. So, this is taking me in favor of ectopic pregnancy. HCG is slightly positive. Again, I am thinking about ectopic pregnancy. HCG is 2800. 
a mass is seen on left adenexa measuring 3 into 2.5 centimeters. So, I am seeing an ectopic mass and the sac size is 3 into 2.5 centimeters. Patient is hemodynamically stable. This means you are dealing with a case of unruptured ectopic. All this is telling you that you are dealing with unruptured ectopic. Typical triad of ectopic pregnancy is present. Urine pregnancy test is positive. Patient's vitals are stable, right? This means you are dealing with unruptured ectopic. Now, so whenever you have a case of unruptured ectopic, this is what I have made you write in your marrow notes that you can either manage it expectantly or medically or surgically. Expectant management is the least preferred one and the most preferred or the best management is medical management. Now, prerequisites for medical management and surgical management. See, medical management is done only if it is a case of unruptured ectopic. In other words, vitals of the patient should be stable. Surgical management can be done in unruptured as well as in ruptured ectopic. So, you can do it in case of ruptured ectopic or unstable vitals also, right? Then comes medical management. Medical management should be done only if the patient's family is not complete. Whereas, even if it is a case of unruptured ectopic, but patient's family is complete, then in that case, I am going to go for surgical management. Are you understanding this? So, in case of ruptured ectopic, the only management is surgical, uh, surgical management. Now, in case of unruptured ectopic, if vitals of the patient, if a family of the patient is not complete, I am going to think about medical management. But if family is complete, again, I am going to think about surgical management, even though it is a case of unruptured ectopic, right? Number three. HCG values. In an unruptured ectopic, if HCG is less than 5000 international units, then only we do medical management. If HCG levels are more than 5000, then you go for surgical management. Then size of the sac. Size of the sac should be less than 4 centimeters, then only you go for medical management. In unruptured ectopic, if they say that the size of the sac is 5 centimeters, you are going to go for surgical management. Then comes cardiac activity. Now, cardiac activity, ideally, it should be absent when you are doing medical management, but this is not an absolute requirement. If cardiac activity is present, I am going to prefer surgical management and I am not going to do medical management. But then that doesn't mean that medical management is contraindicated if cardiac activity is present. Reason being why I am preferring surgical management if cardiac activity is present because if I do medical management in a patient in whom cardiac activity is present inside the ectopic, then the chances of failure of medical management are high. But suppose my patient is insisting, you know, her HCG values are less than 5000, her sac size is around 2 centimeters, right, and cardiac activity is present. And she insists to me that, doctor, I want medical management, then I am going to go for medical management because patient is insisting. Now, if I am going for medical management and cardiac activity is present, then the cutoff value for the sac size is not 4 centimeters, then it becomes 3.5 centimeters. Just now I told you that you are going to do a medical management only if the size of the sac is less than 4 centimeters. But suppose if cardiac activity is present, then you are going to do medical management only if size of the sac is less than 3.5 centimeters, not 4 centimeters. Is this clear to all of you? Yes. So, keeping this in mind, let's see first of all, what am I going to prefer in my patient? Am I going to prefer medical management or am I going to prefer surgical management? HCG is 2800 international unit. It is a case of unruptured ectopic. HCG is 2800 and her size of the ectopic is 3 into 2.5 centimeters. That is less than 4 centimeters, right? Patient is hemodynamically stable. So, what am I going to prefer? Medical management. In unruptured ectopic, if the prerequisites are getting fulfilled, you have to choose medical management over surgical management. You are not going to say salpingectomy. You are not going to say laparoscopic surgery is nothing. 
you are not going to say salping cost me nothing if the prerequisites are getting fulfilled and it is a case of unruptured ectopic you are going to always choose medical management over any other management in unruptured ectopic right now how do you do medical management in a case of unruptured ectopic Medical management, the drug of choice is methotrexate. Now, this methotrexate you have to give 50 milligram per meter square intramuscularly, and whatever dose you are calculating, you are going to give it entirely on day one. Right? The entire dose has to be given on day one. So that means it is a single dose methotrexate injection which has to be given intramuscularly. Repeatedly, I have told you. In uh, choriocarcinomas, when you give methotrexate, in GTNs, when you give methotrexate, you give multi-dose methotrexate therapy alternating with folinic acid. But when you are giving methotrexate in ectopic pregnancy, you give single dose methotrexate. Single dose methotrexate means that the entire dose which you are calculating, you are giving on one particular day. You are not doing this that uh, a part of the dose you are giving today, then a part of the dose day after tomorrow, then a part of the dose after two days, not like this. You are giving whatever dose you are calculating, you are giving at one go, that is single dose methotrexate. Right? So, over here now, your options were oral methotrexate, you never give oral methotrexate. Single methotrexate plus leucovirin, serial methotrexate plus leucovirin rescue, no. Serial methotrexate plus leucovirin you give in case of GTNs. In case of ectopic pregnancy, it's a single dose methotrexate injection. Clear? Now, just one more thing. What are the conditions which should be fulfilled for expectant management? Only and only if your patient is hemodynamically stable, if there is no visible sac on ultrasound and HCG is less than 200 international units and it has a falling trend, then you go for expectant management. Otherwise, always medical management. Coming to the next question and the last question for the day, a woman presents to you at 36 weeks of gestation with complaint of feeling lightheadedness and dizziness when she lies on her back. She says she feels all right if she is, lies on her side or if she walks. What's the most likely reason for this? All of you know that when in the third trimester from 20 weeks onwards, if a patient is going to lie supine, then she is going to have, she, the, her gravid uterus is going to compress the inferior vena cava, the gravid uterus presses on inferior vena cava and that is what leads to decrease in venous return, that leads to a decrease in cardiac output and that is why mother starts having hypotension and there is lightheadedness and dizziness and the, immediately you tell her that if, you know she should lie uh, in left lateral position or she should get up and this problem will go, to go over and this is the reason why that we tell all pregnant females especially in the late third trimester not to lie supine because when they lie supine their cardiac output decreases not only do they experience hypotension but because of decreased cardiac output it can lead to fetal distress that is why all females are asked to lie in left lateral position and not to lie in supine position so this is happening because of the compression of inferior vena cava now in your marrow notes i have made you write minor ailments of pregnancy and their treatment. This is very, very important. Please go through all these minor ailments and their treatments because some way or the other questions are being asked on them. For example, supine hypotension syndrome. What is patient going to complain? She is going to complain of dizziness on lying supine, gravid uterus presses on inferior vena cava. So, there is decreased venous return, decreased cardiac output, decreased BP and decreased cardiac output can lead to fetal distress. How do you manage this? You ask the patient to lie in left lateral position. Now, if a pregnant female comes to you with bleeding gums, again, you have to manage it conservatively by telling her to maintain her oral hygiene. Then pregnancy tumor, epulis or pyogenic granuloma, that's a reddish purplish exophytic growth which is seen in pregnant females. Again, its management is conservative. No excision is required. Varicose veins. Varicose veins are common during pregnancy in the lower limbs, in vulva and in the form of hemorrhoids. Why is this happening? Why are varicose veins common? This is because of increased blood volume and this is because of increased femoral venous 
pressure due to decreased venous return because pre, uh, gravid uterus presses on inferior vena cava so venous return is going to decrease and that is why there is pooling of blood in lower extremities and the femoral venous pressure increases so this excessive venous pooling at the feet it does not lead to supine hypotension syndrome it leads to varicose veins right so next time if they ask you a question on varicose veins and they ask you what is the management please remember varicose veins are managed conservatively in pregnancy you have to tell a female to avoid standing for long hours she can use compression stockings she when when she is resting she should elevate her lower limbs she should lie in left lateral position now during pregnancy medical or surgical treatment of varicose veins should not be done and it should be deferred for 3 to 6 months after delivery now hemorrhoids are also common during pregnancy and the reason is same so for hemorrhoids again you have to tell a patient to increase a fiber intake increase a fluid intake and local anesthetic gels and anti inflammatories can be used for pain for vulval varicosities they can use vulval compression the uh, compressions can be used then in pregnancy patient may have leg cramps and this was a question which was asked in your i and i set that in a pregnant female if leg cramps happen what are you going to do so why do these leg cramps happen they because happen due to accumulation of lactic acid and due to reduced magnesium levels now uh, to prevent leg cramps you can advise your pregnant female to maintain her hydration number 1 number 2 you can ask her to give massage to do massage of her lower limbs number 3 you can advise her that before she goes to bed she can take a hot shower and at the time when she is experiencing leg cramps what she should do she should extend her knees and dorsiflex her toes that was a question which was asked so tell her to extend her knees and dorsiflex the toes whenever leg cramps are happening leg cramps are common during pregnancy then uh, please remember carpal tunnel syndrome is also common during pregnancy and how is a patient of carpal tunnel syndrome going to present to you i'm sure all of you know this patient is going to present to you with numbness and tingling in thumb index and middle finger carpal tunnel syndrome why does it happen it happens because there is fluid retention in pregnancy and this fluid retention can lead to compression of the median nerve now again you have to give symptomatic treatment you can tell her to apply a wrist splint avoid corticosteroid injection and avoid surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome during pregnancy clear to all of you yes so these are some minor ailments which happen during pregnancy and you should be knowing their treatment in brief so i hope all of you uh, enjoyed today's session and you benefited from this session more importantly please bachcho PYQs are important but more important than that are the previous year topics so don't have a very casual approach please whenever you are studying obs and gynae try to uh, you know le learn the concept behind it rather than going for rote learning take care bye bye all the best